Hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, in this video we're going to get into a little bit of water and watercolor and gouache sketching in a mid-tone sketchbook. So starting out just with a loose pencil sketch. Uh, I don't have a clear idea of what I'm going for. All I know is that I want some blue-skinned demon guy. And that's about as far as I got before I started in. But what I'm looking for here really is just getting some basic landmarks that will at least give me a road map toward what I'm doing. I will eventually, I'll start with watercolor, mostly for the shadows. And then as I get toward the lights, that's when I'll bring in the gouache for the opacity. And I'll just be using white gouache and permanent yellow gouache. Uh, and it's mostly just to lend opacity to the watercolors. So this is sped up 200% just because otherwise we're literally watching paint dry and that's not terribly interesting if you're not in the middle of it. And I don't think I'm really doing anything that requires us to go very slow. So in the interest of keeping it interesting, I sped it up. Uh, the drawing itself, I think, was about nine minutes. So you'll just see me kind of fleshing it out here a little bit for a few minutes. And because I'm just kind of making it up as I go, I'm searching for the forms a little bit and kind of trying to figure out uh, what might create an interesting sketch, or at least something that's interesting enough for me to start painting on top of. Um, this is kind of still just practice for me. I'm not going to say that I'm any kind of an expert, uh, but I do have enough of an understanding of light and form and, and the mediums to at least get them to kind of do what I want them to a little bit. It feels more like a controlled fall half the time, but uh, you know, I can at least teeter and veer toward my mark. <laughs> I think that's about the extent uh, of my knowledge. At least that's how it feels half the time. So I'm not getting too heavy into any kind of rendering. I might sort of scribble in some shadows here and there, but this really just acts as a basic outline. Uh, it gives me some structural points to follow. Uh, I don't tend to like to make my roughs very tight no matter what I'm doing. Uh, mostly because I like to kind of keep it interesting for myself through every step of the process. And if I really hammer out a rough and, and kind of define everything, then I sort of feel like it's done and, and then all I'm doing is tracing and I lose interest and then usually the sketch will end up being less interesting as a result, uh, which I hope that makes sense to everyone, right? If the artist isn't interested, the sketch will probably not be interesting, uh, or the drawing or the painting, however finished it is. So um, we'll be jumping into the colors here and all I'm doing is squeezing out some drops of water onto my watercolors to start to reconstitute them as I jump in. And you'll notice here I don't tend to clean off my palette very much. Um, I like having those kind of base colors that add some interest and usually because I'll break it up a little bit you can see the four divisions in that palette and I'll usually have something that airs on the blue side or the cool side somewhere, something that's a little more red, something that's a little more yellow. So I tend to keep those a little separate, at least enough um, that I don't have to worry about contaminating the colors too much. So I can kind of just jump in into the palette without having to clean it off and it gives me just, I don't know, variety in the color. And all I'm looking for right now is, is a generally cool, 
thin, you know, a transparent color or where I'll start blocking in some of the shadows. Um, knowing that I want him to be blue, right? So on top of that, the other thing that transparency gives me when I water it down is these interesting kind of watermarks that you get in watercolor and gouache. And when you mix the two, when because gouache is so kind of sensitive once it dries, uh, when it dries, if you do put a wet mark over the top and just let it sit, you'll get these really nice edges on that mark that are pretty unique to the medium. And uh, it's one of my one of the reasons that I use it, and I love I love those marks. So, on top of wanting to render a bit of the form, I also am aiming to just get some kind of beautiful shapes happening. Uh, from the natural sort of chemistry of the paint and the water and the brush. So, and here I'm wanting to shift the color a little bit. So I have this kind of little bit of a warmer blue. And now I want to bring some variation. I uh, want to bring a bit of, of green to it, right? Just as our skin naturally kind of fluctuates. You get areas that are warmer, you get areas that cool off, right? You'll get areas that are a little more yellow or a little more red or areas that are a little more blue. So I want to bring some of that natural variation uh, to hopefully lend a little bit of credibility to this blue skinned whatever he is. And it's nothing it's nothing crazy like i i'm not there aren't a lot of secrets to this some of it is just confidence right putting marks down and not fussing with them too much you can layer this stuff as much as you want more or less of course there's always limitations but as long as you don't fuss with the marks too much while they're wet because that'll start to worry the paper right that'll start to uh, sort of sh not shred the paper but it'll start to mess with it and that's where you'll get areas that are overworked because the paper can't handle that anymore now true watercolor paper would be able to handle it more especially a cold press paper it's pretty tough and resilient um, this is not <laughs> watercolor paper so all you want to do is make sure that if you want to change something or shift a color um, do it sparingly or wait till it's dry and and then you'll be pretty good for the most part um, so I'm just laying down these kind of base colors and what that'll give me and what I'm kind of doing still is deciding how much of that mid-tone paper, if any, I want to show through in its unaltered state. Right now, I'm getting these sort of base colors and the shadows and the hair, knowing that as I throw colors on top of it, as long as I'm working transparently, those base tones will kind of unify the palette. So I could come in and throw some warmer colors on top. As long as they're transparent, that blue will come through and unify it with whatever colors I put on top. So I'm, like I said, I'm kind of just making this up as I go. So I'm trying to decide still, like, how much, how far I want to take this and what my ultimate goal is, which will kind of determine how dark I go with the shadows, what kind of base colors I lay down, right? So I'm going to lay down some color for the horns, knowing that as I paint on top, then this color will show through. Um, 
and I will end up darkening the horns <clears throat> because one of the things that happens is as I darken the hair the color that I've laid down for the horns actually is a little bit too light and doesn't give me much leeway for when I work in gouache. When I bring the gouache in, it's not gonna give me enough room to go lighter with the values without going too close to white, which I don't want because everything starts to flatten out at that point. <clears throat> so I'm, you know, just defining kind of one form at a time, figuring these things out, figuring out what kind of lighting scenario I want. I don't go for anything super complex. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Lights kind of lighting this guy from the front and up a bit. Um, it's nothing crazy because I'm not trying to make this more complex for myself. A lot of this is just experimenting and, and playing around with the medium and just getting to know it. Um, and you can see I decide, decided not to let much of the paper show through. I decide I want a base tone, this kind of greenish blue, obviously unified by that mid-tone of the paper, right? Because everything right now is transparent. And you can already see these kind of nice watermarks, some of which will stick around for the end, a lot of which get covered up and replaced by others um, as I push and pull values. And of course, as you sort of start to tone everything down, you realize, oh, hey, what, I, what was dark enough before isn't anymore so you kind of have to sort of keep adjusting as you go um, and that's one of the big differences right between working out of your head which I'm doing here and working from reference if you have reference uh, obviously I don't have reference for this guy uh, you could create your own reference but it seems kind of redundant right because you'd have to kind of paint this guy up in some way, maybe digitally, uh, and then use that as reference for another painting, which is kind of silly. Um, but when you have reference, you have your values uh, sort of worked out for you already. So a little less searching, and I'd be able to put down some more direct marks and direct values and a little less layering one thing on top of the other. Um, so for this, I am going a bit slower. The entire piece takes about an hour and 10 minutes, I think, versus if I was working from reference, it might take me half the time because I'm not having to make everything up. So, but I enjoy working from my head makes me happy and so a lot of these marks are really just sort of seeing how, how much of this do I want to define do I want to let any of it kind of melt together like watercolor does so well um, here I just again I want some of that natural variation that you get in skin tone so getting some of that heat in the mouth right the lips the eyes these places where kind of capillaries are closer to the surface right and the blood is closer to the surface and showing through a bit so uh, naturally the eyelids will be a little warmer lips are much warmer cheeks might be warmer nose um, so I want to bring that in to lend a little bit more credibility to this strange character. And I'd thought about maybe getting into some skin markings, um, 
but just given where he went, uh, it wasn't really set up for that. So I'll probably get into something like that later. You know, just warming up the ears, and I'm a fan of pink ears and pink noses. <laughs> With a lot of this stuff, as you're painting, if the values are good, if the values are correct, um, you can get away with some pretty crazy color combinations. People will question that less if the values are strong, if the values are accurate. If your values are off, that can screw everything up. Um, and there, you can see I just, laid down a base color for the eyes. I know I want him to have golden eyes like a lion. Um, and so I'm just given a base, essentially a shadow color for the eyes. Um, wetting that paper towel to lay the gouache down because we're going to start pretty soon getting into some opaque painting. And again, I'm just using a permanent white and a permanent yellow. Um, both are made by Holbein. Uh, they are my gouache of choice because they choose their pigments based on their natural opacity. So they don't really get chalky. Now they still have the fun challenge, as gouache does, of changing value as they dry, right? Dark colors tend to go lighter as they dry. Light colors tend to go darker as they dry. So it's kind of just a matter of getting to know the medium. Um, you can always lay a color down, have a scrap piece of paper that's hopefully the same type of paper that you're doing your painting on, and just lay marks down on there. Let them dry, see how they change, and adjust accordingly so you're not having to risk messing up your, uh, your actual painting. Um, decided I wanted a higher contrast piece. Initially, I was thinking I might keep it a little more atmospheric, more air in the shadows. Decided I wanted a higher contrast piece, so I am going in with some heavier accents uh, and warmer accents that I did previously. Cold shadows, for whatever reason, do tend to flatten out a bit, at least when you get into the deep shadows. Um, so oftentimes when you get into those accented darks and it's a sort of nondescript color, it's nice to air on the warm side and it tends to uh, give them a little more depth. And, you know, I really should have just painted straight over the horn. Uh, because I think by the end, a, uh, the hair gets a little too sort of sculpted around that horn. And because I was going to come in with opaque paint anyway, I could have just painted right over the shadows. Should have done that, and I didn't. Um, hindsight and all, next time. But that's all part of the learning process. Know, especially when you go back and watch watch yourself paint, it's... It's an interesting experience, and sometimes I wonder, like, wait, why did I make that choice? And it made sense at the time, I'm sure, but I don't remember the reasoning. Like, I really should have just done a wash right over that horn and not worried about it um, until I come in with the gouache. But, oh well. Um, really just trying to add variety. Right, starting to define some of the little details that'll hopefully add a little more credibility, a little more character. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure how rendered or how detailed I was going to end up going. Right, I definitely end up focusing on the face and letting the rest uh, kind of loosen up, but... Um, starting to want to create a little more value design. Uh, you soften up some edges. Um, always a good rule of thumb is those soft and hard edges, right? As the form goes from the light in turns, turns into the form shadow, you get that soft edge. 
usually whatever form is turning will then cast a shadow on the structure next to it, right? So you'll get then a deeper shadow, a cast shadow that will have a hard edge as it goes back into the light. So um, it's kind of a good little cheat. It's not always directly applicable, but it is something to at least keep in mind, uh, especially when you're working out of your head. Um, using this green, this kind of green blue, just to unify things a little bit, it was starting to get a little too separated and uh, wanting to create a bit more light fall off. Figured maybe the light source is something that's a little closer to him, so maybe it's falling off as it goes down the torso. And when we get into the highlights, you'll see I'll definitely go a bit heavier on the highlights on the head and the horns and keep them a little lighter in the torso. So here is where I realized that I was going to need a little more room to play with the values on the horns. So I needed to darken them. I wanted to reinforce their color and separate it a bit from the skin tones. They were a little too muted to where I was afraid they might get kind of lost and, and we wouldn't get a clear sense of the kind of bony structure of them. Right, I was really thinking of, of like ram horns or like big horn sheep. Um, so here, this is literally just white gouache mixed with watercolor and the gouache is just giving me some opacity, keeping it a little transparent because I do want that underlying color to come through a little bit. Uh, it might be subtle, or at least it looks more subtle at first, but once it dries and the water evaporates, then the opacity kind of uh, kicks down a bit, and then you can see some of the underlying brush strokes in areas. Uh, and one of the things that this does, because gouache, again, is so sensitive, it gives me a nice base palette to work on top of later to bring in some more interesting marks. Uh, I'm very into mark making. As we go through more videos in the future, you will see. <laughs> I'm like a mark making whore. Um, this shit makes me happy. And this is where I'm, you'll see I'm kind of, I'm aware that I want to keep the values down on the chest. I just, I don't really want the chest to pop and I'm not really that concerned with uh, rendering it too much. Because I was really, this, this was more than anything kind of a practice in um, sort of detail work, I guess, which is why I do focus more on the face because the amount of detail and uh, just sort of toying with ideas of uh, maybe how I might do an actual illustration. Um, taking advantage of the paint still being wet here, knowing that it'll create some softer edges, and that's always something to be aware of. Um, usually if, if you throw down a wash, you have a little more time than you might think to mix up some more color and incorporate it in without it drying out too much. Um, upside again of watercolor paper is because a good watercolor paper tends to be uh, a cotton paper, it does hold, it retains the moisture a bit longer and some do it better than others if that's something you like. Some people like a very fast drying paper, right? In my experience, Arches watercolor paper dries faster than, say, Saunders watercolor paper. Uh, but I like Saunders because it doesn't dry so fast. Uh, now this is just a Strathmore mixed media sketchbook. So it's not really watercolor paper at all, but it's 
sort of somewhere in between. It's meant to be able to take a bit of wet media or dry media, depending on whatever you want to do. So, um, but it does, it, it actually retains moisture fairly well, better than I was expecting. So I am able to kind of lay down a wash, um, mix up some color and bring it back in and know that I can still keep some soft edges. I'm going to get into the eyes here, uh, so very kind of detailed work, just laying in the lights, which will sort of define the color, the color in the eye. And I make the mistake of not letting it dry thoroughly before <laughs> bringing in the pupil. So I have to redo a little bit of it, but you know, whoops. Dope, okay, dab it up, dab it up. Um, so come back in, which was good because if you look on the left eye, the color did not dry as high key as I wanted. I wanted something lighter than that and that almost disappears into that initial mid-tone that I laid down. So, there's our lights, right? If the light is coming a little bit from the upper left, camera left, right? His up, his right, just a little, not much, but uh, that's where it's catching the, the iris. So we'll let that dry and it's always a good opportunity to move on and work on some other stuff so you're not just kind of waiting and not doing anything. Um, start to define the horns a bit, get some details in there. And this detail is pretty much all just indicated. I'm not, this is not what I would call rendering, right? These are a lot of very sort of symbolic marks that kind of convey the idea quickly. Uh, I'm not getting into a lot of transition tones, right? Normally I would, if I was really going to render this, we'd have those areas, these little light catchers, right? Which is really more of an automotive term. Um, you'll see on cars around the windows, you get all these little edges. Sometimes they're little chrome linings and they're meant to just catch light and create a bit of sparkle and interest in these areas of detail. Um, but anatomy is very similar. You get these areas that naturally kind of catch highlights. So normally, say with the horns, I would put these these highlighted areas, but also have them casting shadows, get a little bit of form shadow, if I was gonna really render this out. But that wasn't really the point of this exercise. Um, this is more about kind of working quickly, getting ideas down in a sketchbook, um, and not meant to be any kind of a finished piece per se. Uh, even though, I mean, you know, when a sketch is done, it's done, and it's a finished piece in its own right. Now just wanting to bring in a little more detail and interest. Um, it's got the gnarly hairy ears. Dude needs a hedge trimmer for that. Um, just wanting to create also some uh, color variation in the hair. I didn't want him to have just kind of like a single tone mop. <laughs> um, I want some, some variation. Here's our pupils, which already start to make those eyes pop. And then when we do drop in the specular highlight on the upper left of each eye, uh, you'll see they'll pop even more. For now, just bring in the accents. And we warmed up that accent, accented dark right, to start to reinforce some of these areas that do have a bit more blood, uh, that might catch some light, might naturally have a little bit of 
transillumination happening uh, where the light is basically just refracting through the form and you get a little more of that red glow. Um, now I didn't go too heavy into that but adding a bit more heat into some of those accents can give uh, that illusion. Thinning it down just helps to sink his eyes back, right? To get those deeper shadows in the corners of his eyes. Um, and then this is what I was talking about before where I'm just laying down marks to knowing that when they dry, because of the sort of watery nature of the marks, when they dry, uh, we'll get this nice watermark edge, which you can already see uh, in, in the kind of sunken cheekbone there, right? Right in the middle of his cheek, you can already see that kind of sharp edge around the mark, but with that, that natural contour. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of those watermarks. <laughs> they make me very happy. Highlights, detailed work. Hold your breath. Um, boom, eyes pop, right? Give some life to them. Um, so it's kind of the, always one of the last orders of business is just bringing in the little highlights uh, that start to sort of define that kind of lighter edge of the forms, right? And hopefully, if it's done right, they'll start to pop. So coming into these natural light catchers in the face, right, usually around the nostrils, tip of the nose, corners of the eyes, inner and outer corners of the eyes, right, that outer, upper corners of the cheeks, um, corners of the mouth, top of the chin, and usually the upper edge of the upper lip, um, and then the kind of peak of the forehead the corners of the forehead. Those are usually places where we find highlights. And then what I'll also tend to do, and just sort of a personal thing, I'm not even sure where I picked it up, but I'll also bring in some lighter marks in the kind of corners between forms, right? That sort of help to sort of define muscular structures or just make something feel a little more sculptural. And you'll see, I'll bring a line down the center of the chest and that sort of defines the pectorals a bit. Uh, I'll go around the muzzle, um, right there, here on the brows. It just sort of defines those structures separately. Um, and I don't know, it just has an effect that I really like and I, I'm not sure where I picked it up or um, why it resonates with me but it does and I tend to do it on most of my drawings and paintings sometimes more overt sometimes more subtle depending And one of the things that'll happen, and I'm doing it right now, is in the neck area there, it just, it gets too busy. And I see that and I'll come in with a kind of wash and just sort of simplify everything. I think I even come in with just water and basically just scrub uh, some of that paint around and, and knock back those hard edges, uh, darken it a bit. Uh, it might even be just a kind of a thin wash that knocks it down a couple notches in value and um, allows me to soften those edges and simplify that area. And I see it here and I'm liking the darker marks but it's too it's too high contrast and I'm like ah, no let's kick that back it sort of acts as a, an occlusion shadow eventually. Um, I don't worry about I don't really worry about getting much of a cast shadow there, but um, 
you can see it's most of this process for me has just been kind of pushing and pulling going carefully not going too heavy with any values right off the bat because I'm not sure if I'm going to want to change it just softening up some edges and um, you know I'm pretty happy with where it is at this point just as far as a little sketch goes an hour long sketch um, pretty content throw in a couple details and I've got some nice fun watermarks happening and that was pretty much all I was setting out to do uh, having fun painting a demon <clears throat> so you'll see those kind of nice marks on the face uh, in the cheeks those sort of hard edges that are going on uh, that I love so much and I hope you do too and thanks for joining me uh, looking forward to doing some more art with you guys uh, enjoy <laughs>